Chapter 5 Lante Burton Inside were a young mother and her children, all dead. The mother had started the engine of the old car and left it running. Of course, the apartment was empty when I returned Friday night, but there was a note in the kitchen. Just like me, Claire had gone home to her parents in Providence for a couple of days. I knew Claire wanted to end the marriage, too. I just didn't know how badly. I went for a long walk. It was very cold outside, with a strong wind. I passed beautiful homes with families in them, eating and laughing and enjoying the warmth. Then I moved on to M Street. Friday night on M was always fun time. The bars and coffee shops were full, and people were waiting in line to get into the restaurants. I stopped at the window of a music club, listening to sad music with snow over my feet watching the young couples drink and dance. For the first time in my life, I didn't feel young. I was 32, but in the last five years, I had worked more than most people do in 20. I was tired. Those pretty girls in there would never look at me now. I went back to the apartment. At some time after nine, the phone rang. It was Mordecai Green. Are you busy? he asked. To do what? To work. The shelters are full. We don't have enough helpers. I've never done that kind of work. Can you put butter on bread? I think so. Then you're the man for us. We're at a church on 13th and Euclid. I'll be there in 20 minutes. I changed into the oldest clothes I had, jeans and an old blue jacket, and took most of my money out of my wallet. As I closed the apartment door behind me, I was excited, and I didn't exactly know why. I parked the Lexus opposite the church. The attack I half expected didn't happen. No gangs. The snow kept the streets empty and safe for now. I went into the church, down into a big room below it, and entered the world of the homeless. It was unbelievable how many people were in that room. Volunteers were giving out blankets and apples. Mordecai was pouring fruit juice into paper cups and talking all the time. A line waited patiently for food at a table. I went to Mordecai, and he said hello like I was an old friend. It's crazy, he said. One big snowstorm, and we work all night. He showed me the bread, the butter, the meat, and the cheese. It's real complicated. You do ten with meat, and then ten with cheese, okay? Yeah. You learn fast. Then he disappeared. I made ten sandwiches quickly, then I slowed and watched all the people. Most of the homeless looked down at the floor. Most of them said thank you to the volunteers when they got the food. Then they ate slowly. Even the children were careful with their food. Mordecai came back and started making sandwiches next to me. Where does the food come from? I asked him. Food bank. People give it. Tonight we're lucky because we have chicken. Usually it's just vegetables. How many shelters like this are there in the city? This isn't actually a shelter. The church kindly opens its doors when the weather's bad. When the doors close, they go out again. I tried to understand this. Then where do these people live? Some are squatters. They're the lucky ones. Some live on the streets, some in parks, some in bus stations, some under bridges. 
Usually it's okay, but they can't stay out in the open tonight. It's too cold. They have to go to one of the shelters. How many shelters are there? About twenty. Two are closing soon. No money. How many beds? About five thousand. And how many homeless? Good question. They're a difficult group to count. Maybe ten thousand. I thought about that. Then I asked Mordecai about himself. You have a family? Yes. A wife? Three sons? One's in college, one's in the army, and, and we lost our third boy on the streets ten years ago. He was killed. Gangs. What about you? Married. No kids. Mordecai disappeared again. A helper brought cookies. I took four of them and walked to a corner where a young mother was asleep with a baby under her arm and two small children half asleep under blankets. The oldest boy's eyes opened wide when he saw the cookies in my hand. I gave him one. His eyes shone as he took it and ate all of it. Then he wanted another one. He was small and thin, no more than four years old. The mother woke up, saw the cookies, and smiled. What's your name? I said to the boy. After two cookies, he was my friend for life. Ontario? How old are you? He showed me four fingers. Four? I said. He said yes and put his hand out for another cookie, which I gladly gave him. I wanted to give him things, anything he wanted. Where do you live? I whispered. In a car, he whispered back. You got more apple juice? Sure. I went to the kitchen and got him a cup of apple juice and more cookies. The mother was sleeping again. Like many homeless people, she moved a lot in her sleep. She was cold. I took my jacket off and put it over her. Then the baby cried and woke her. Without thinking, I took the baby, smiling at the mother all the time. She was happy to let me hold it so she could get some sleep. I stayed there until three in the morning. The next day was Saturday. Since Tuesday, when I met Mr., I hadn't worked even one hour for Drake and Sweeney. I lay in bed. I hated the work at Drake and Sweeney. I didn't want to go back, ever. I had breakfast at a cafe on M and wondered what Ontario was having for breakfast. Then I went shopping. Candy and small toys for the kids, soap for the mall, warm clothes in lots of children's sizes. I'd never had so much fun spending $200. And I wanted to spend more. I wanted to put that family in a hotel for a month. I wanted to start a lawsuit against the person who had made them homeless. I couldn't wait to have Ontario's family as my clients. I went back to the church, leaving all the toys and clothes in the car. But Ontario's family weren't there. I asked Mordecai where they were. Who knows? The homeless go from kitchen to kitchen, shelter to shelter. Next morning, Sunday, I had the small television in the kitchen on while I ate breakfast. But the TV news stopped me from eating. I heard the words, but I didn't want to believe them. I walked toward the television. My feet were heavy. My heart was cold. My mouth was open in shock and disbelief. Sometime around 11 p.m., Washington police found a small car near Fort Totten Park in a gang area in the northeast of the city. It was parked on the street, Inside were a young mother and her children, all dead. 
The mother had started the engine of the old car and left it running to keep the family warm. The air in the car poisoned them while they slept. They gave the mother's name. It was Lante Burton. The baby was Tomiko. The other children were Alonzo and Ontario. Their candy and toys and soap and clothes were still in my car. Chapter 6 A New Person Now I, too, carried my photograph of a 22-year-old black mother who had died for nothing in a car. I was at the 14th Street Law Center. How much would a funeral cost? I asked Mordecai. I don't know. Are you interested? I want them to have a good funeral. Okay, then. Let's arrange it now. We got into Mordecai's old Ford Taurus. The Burton family's bodies were in the morgue of the general hospital. Mordecai entered like he owned the place. I'm Mordecai Green, lawyer for the Burton family, he informed an anxious young man behind the desk. A doctor from the hospital arrived, and Mordecai pushed open the big metal door. Inside the white room were lines of bodies covered in sheets. Their names were on little pieces of paper tied to their toes. We stopped in a corner. Lante Burton, said the doctor, and pulled the sheet down to her waist. It was Ontario's mother, all right, in a white dress. She looked the same as when I saw her alive a few days ago. She looked like she was sleeping. I couldn't stop staring at her. That's her, said Mordecai in a confident and loud voice, like he'd known her for years. Only one sheet covered the children. They were lying in a line with their hands by their sides like little soldiers. I wanted to touch Ontario. I wanted to tell him I was sorry. I wanted to wake him up, take him home, give him some food, give him everything he could ever want. That's them, said Mordecai. I looked up to heaven, and I heard a voice in my head say, Don't let it happen again. The doctor took us to an office. We helped the assistant make a list of everything that had been found with the family. My old blue jacket was the best thing they owned. Do you want it back? Mordecai asked me. No. I waited outside in the car while Mordecai arranged the funeral in another office. He told me the price would go up if they saw my expensive clothes. In less than a week, I had seen five dead street people. First, Mr. had changed my life. Now Ontario had broken my heart. There was a knock on the car window. I jumped. It's five thousand dollars, all four. Mordecai shouted through the closed car window. Yeah, yeah, I said, and he disappeared back into the hospital. Soon he was back, driving fast. The funeral will be Tuesday at the church here at the hospital. The newspapers will be there, and television. It's a big story. Thanks, Mordecai, I said. After the funeral, there's going to be a march, a march to the government buildings on Capitol Hill for the Burton family. Television is going to film it. The newspapers are going to write about it. Are you okay? No. I called in sick Tuesday. At ten, I left for the funeral. It was a very nice church. Beautiful. It didn't open its doors to the homeless, and I could understand why. I sat alone. I could see Mordecai with two people I didn't know. The TV people were in one corner. I could also see the coffins. The baby's coffin was very small. 
Ontario's coffin and his brother's were bigger, but not much bigger. Lante Burton's parents were dead, but her grandmother was there. She put flowers on the coffins, and for a terrible second I thought she was going to open them. I had never been to a black funeral before, and I didn't know what to expect. But I had seen old film of coffins open at funerals. After the funeral, there was the march to Capitol Hill. There were big photos of Lante Burton everywhere, and under her face the words, Who Killed Lante? On Capitol Hill, Mordecai spoke to the people. He didn't talk about the homeless. He talked about the last hours of the Burton family. He talked about the baby's last meal in the church. He talked about the cookies the boys had eaten. He described how the little family left the church and went back onto the streets, into the snowstorm where Lante and her children lived only a few more hours. Mordecai described things he didn't actually know had happened, but I didn't care, and the crowd didn't either. When he described the family trying to get warm before they died, I heard women crying around me. If this man, Mordecai Green, could make a crowd cry like this, he must be a great lawyer. When Mordecai finished, we marched to the Capitol, the government building, carrying the coffins. I had never been on a march like this before. Rich people don't march. Their world is safe and clean, and there are laws to keep them happy. But now I, too, carried my photograph of a 22-year-old black mother who had died for nothing in a car. I wasn't the same person as I had been before Mr. and Ontario came into my life, and I could never be that person again. So I accepted when Mordecai Green phoned me a few days later and invited me to a restaurant near DuPont Circle. And when he invited me to join the 14th Street Law Center, I accepted his offer of a job, too. We can pay you $30,000 a year, smiled Mordecai. You'll be a partner. Let's see Drake and Sweeney beat that. I smiled, too. I nearly told him about the file I needed from Drake and Sweeney, the file that would give us the story of Devon Hardy's eviction, but I didn't. That night, I told Claire my news. It was almost ten, and we were sitting in our favorite chairs with glasses of wine. After a few minutes, I said, We need to talk. What is it? she asked, unworried. I'm thinking of leaving Drake and Sweeney. Oh, really? She either expected this or wanted to seem calm. I had told her all about Lante Burton and her family. Yes, I can't go back there. Why not? The work's boring and unimportant. I want to do something to help people. I told you about Mordecai Green. His law center has offered me a job. I'm starting Monday. How much did he offer you? Thirty thousand a year. That's $90,000 a year less than you earn now. You don't do work for the homeless for the money. As young law and medical students, we had wanted to help people. We told ourselves then that money was not important. And now? I'm tired, she said. She finished her wine and went to the bedroom. The next day, she visited a divorce lawyer. I promised to leave the apartment by the weekend. Chapter 7 Braden Chants and River Oaks The note read, Top key is to Chance's door. Bottom key is to the file drawer under the window. I went back to Drake and Sweeney for my last day. 
They didn't want me to leave. There was a lot of work, and they didn't want to find someone new. I was invited to breakfast with Arthur Jacobs in the partner's private dining room on the eighth floor. How could I turn my back on a world of breakfasts in the partner's dining room? That was the idea. Over breakfast, Arthur suggested that I could stop working at Drake and Sweeney for a year and work pro bono at the law center. He said that Drake and Sweeney should do more pro bono work. He offered to pay the difference between the law center's 30000 a year and what I earned at Drake and Sweeney. I smiled. I would be Drake and Sweeney's pro bono boy for a year, and they could all feel good about themselves. During that year, a partner would take my clients. I would return after a year, happy, and take my clients back. Actually, I didn't say no immediately. They had at least tried. Arthur often talked about pro bono work, though clients and their paid hours always came first. But I thought about the offer, and then I said no. By now, I hated my old work too much to go back to it. I didn't like the old me that had done the work very much either. I was trying to explain to Arthur that I was a different man now, when Braden Chance sat down at a table not far from ours. He didn't see me at first, but then I saw him staring at me. Good morning, Braden, I said loudly. Arthur turned around to see who I was talking to. You know him? he asked quietly. We've met, I said. He's a fool, said Arthur very quietly. It was the same word the legal assistant had used about chance. When I got back to my office, there were two files on my desk. They hadn't been there before my breakfast with Arthur. In the first one, there was a list of names headed People Evicted, River Oaks. Number four was Devon Hardy. Number ten was Lante Burton and three children. I sat there for two or three minutes in silence. Why would anyone put something like this on my desk if the information wasn't true? At the bottom of the page, someone had written a few words in pencil. The eviction was wrong. I opened the second file. There were two keys in it and a typed note. The note read, Top key is to Chance's door. Bottom key is to the file drawer under the window. I put the files away. I had to do some work. I also had a working lunch that day. Working lunch meant that the client was paying. But the law had never seemed so unimportant and boring. I got through the day only because I knew it was my last at Drake and Sweeney. It was almost five before I got a few minutes alone. I said goodbye to Polly and locked the office door from the inside. I took the files out again and began to think and make notes. I had an idea who had sent the files. The young legal assistant who had called Chance a fool. Legal assistants did the evictions, and it was his job to put documents in the file. I phoned another legal assistant and asked him for the name of Chance's assistant. The guy was called Hector Palma. He had been with Drake and Sweeney about three years, all in real estate. We met in the library on the third floor. Hector Palma was very nervous. Did you put those files on my desk? I asked him. There was no time to play games. What files? His eyes went around and around the room, looking at everything except me. The River Oaks eviction. You were there, right? Yeah, he said. What's in the River Oaks file? Bad stuff. Tell me. 
I have a wife and four kids. I need this job. You'll be okay. You're leaving. What do you care? I wasn't surprised, he knew. People talked. I was news. So, before I leave, you want me to go into Chance's office and take a file? And I can't be sure what's in it? Do what you want. And he ran out of the library. I went back to my office and made some more notes. I would lose my job if I was caught taking the file, but I was already leaving. It would be much worse if I was caught in Chance's office with a key that wasn't mine. I didn't like the idea at all. Then there was the problem of copying the file. Some Drake and Sweeney files were very thick. I would have to stand in front of a photocopier for a long time. And also, our photocopiers worked from a plastic card that had our names on it. Drake and Sweeney knew exactly who copied what. I could use a photocopier somewhere else, but it was illegal to take the file from the building. And I was a lawyer. But couldn't I just borrow the file? I only needed it for half an hour to photocopy it. I could take it to the 14th Street Law Center, photocopy it, and bring it back immediately. That made me a little less of a thief. It was now getting late, this Friday night. I was starting work with Mordecai on Monday. It was now or never. But I hadn't got a key to the 14th Street Law Center. I looked at my watch. It was half past six. I drove to 14th Street. My partners were still there. Sophia actually smiled at me, but only for a second. Welcome to your new job, said Mordecai seriously, like I needed all the luck in the world. How about this, he said, pointing at my new office. The best office in the area. Beautiful, I said, stepping inside. My new office was about half the size of the one I had just left. My Drake and Sweeney desk would be too big to go in there. There was no phone. I like it, I said, and I did. I'll get you a phone tomorrow, said Mordecai. It was dark, and Sophia wanted to leave. Mordecai and I ate some sandwiches he had bought. He made us both coffee. I looked at the copier. It was about ten years old, but I knew it worked. What time are you leaving tonight? I asked Mordecai with my mouth full of sandwich. I don't know. In an hour, maybe. Why? I'm going back to Drake and Sweeney for a couple of hours. I have some last-minute stuff they want me to finish. Then I'd like to come back here late. Would that be possible? Mordecai was eating his sandwich. He reached into a drawer and threw me a key. Come and go as you please he said. Will it be safe? No, so be careful. Park as close to the door as you can. Walk fast, then lock yourself in. I walked fast to my car at 7.30. The sidewalk was empty. My Lexus was fine. Maybe I would be okay on the streets. The drive back to Drake and Sweeney took 11 minutes. If it took 30 minutes to copy Chance's file, then it would be out of his office for about an hour, and he would never know. Real estate was empty. I knocked on Chance's door. No answer. I used the key to his door and went in. Should I turn on the light? It was dark. I would have to. I locked the door, turned on the light, went to the bottom file drawer under the window and unlocked it with the second key. I found the River Oaks file and was reading through it when a voice outside shouted, Hey! And I jumped. A conversation started outside. Two guys were talking baseball. I turned off the lights, listening to their talk. Then I sat on Chance's sofa for ten minutes. I could put the file back. 
If they saw me leaving Chance's office, nothing would be done. It was my last day. But if they saw me taking a file, that was very different. Be patient, I told myself. After baseball, they started talking about girls. I think they were a couple of young legal assistants working late. Then finally, it was quiet. I locked the drawer in the dark, opened the door, and went out. Hey! shouted someone behind me. I ran. I ran to the back of the building, got into the Lexus, and drove off. That was stupid, I thought. Why did I run? Why didn't I talk to the guy? I still worked at Drake and Sweeney, didn't I? That was my last thought before the Lexus was hit by a Jaguar speeding down 18th Street. I remember a voice saying, I don't see any blood. And then I remember Claire sitting by my bed at the George Washington University Medical Center. Chapter 8 Hector Palma. Michael, you won't be a lawyer when they've finished. Not here, not anywhere. You're going to lose your license. I woke up at seven in the morning, and a nurse gave me a note from Claire. It was a really sweet note. It said that she had to go to work, and that she had spoken to my doctors, and I probably wouldn't die. Claire and I must look like a happily married couple to the doctors and nurses. Why were we getting a divorce? My left arm was blue. My chest hurt when I breathed. I looked at my face in the bathroom. There were some small cuts, but nothing that wouldn't disappear over the weekend. A nurse told me the Jaguar had been driven by a gang member who sold drugs. Welcome to the streets, I thought, as I tried not to breathe too much. The doctor came at 7.30. No bones were broken. They wanted me to stay in a hospital for one more day just to be safe, but I said no. I had to find a new apartment. The first real estate office sent me to an apartment at Adams Morgan, north of DuPont Circle. It was three little rooms at the top of a house. Everything in the bathroom worked. The floor was clean. There was a view over the streets. I took it. That evening, I went back to my old apartment to see Claire. We ate a Chinese carryout. Our first ever meal together had been a carryout. And this was our last meal together as husband and wife. Claire had the divorce papers waiting for me on the table, and I signed them. In six months, I would be single. Do you know someone called Hector Palma? She asked, halfway through the Chinese dinner. My eyes opened wide. Yes? He called an hour ago. Said he had to talk to you. Who is he? A legal assistant with Drake and Sweeney. He wants me to help him. He has a problem. Must be a big one. He wants to meet with you at nine tonight, at Nathan's on M Street. Why a bar, I said, half to myself, half to Claire. He didn't say. He sounded strange on the phone. Suddenly, I wasn't hungry. I finished the meal only because I didn't want to look worried in front of Claire. But it wasn't necessary. She wasn't even looking at me. I walked to M Street. Parking is impossible on a Saturday night. It was raining and my chest hurt. As I walked, I thought about what to say. I thought of lies I could tell. After taking the file, it seemed easier to lie. Hector might be there for Drake and Sweeney. He might be wired to record what I said. I would listen carefully and say little. Nathan's was only half full. I was ten minutes early, but he was there, waiting for me at a table in the corner. 
As I came in, he jumped up from his seat and put his hand out. You must be Michael. I'm Hector Palmer from Real Estate. Nice to meet you. Huh? Didn't we meet in the library? We sat down. He started kicking me under the table. I understood. He was wired, and they were watching. A waiter came. I ordered black coffee, and Hector asked for a beer. I'm a legal assistant in real estate, Hector explained as the drinks arrived. You've met Braden Chance, one of our partners? Yes, I said. As they were recording everything I said, I would say as little as possible. I worked mainly for him. You and I spoke for a minute one day last week when you visited his office. If you say so, I don't remember seeing you. He smiled, and I kicked him back under the table. We both understood the situation now. Listen, I asked you to meet me because a file is missing from Braden's office. And you think I took it? Well, no, but it could be you. You asked for that file when you went into his office last week. So you do think I took it, I said angrily. Well, go to the police. Hector Palma drank some of his beer. Drake and Sweeney have already gone to the police, he said. The police found an empty file in your desk with a note about two keys. One to the door, the other to a file drawer. They also found your fingerprints on the file drawer. I hadn't thought about fingerprints. Drake and Sweeney took everybody's fingerprints when they joined the company. But that was five years ago, and I had forgotten about it. We might want to speak to you about all of this again later, said Hector Palma. I picked up my coat and left. I spent my first working day at the 14th Street Law Center getting the file back from the wreck of the Lexus. Mordecai helped me. We had to go to Georgia Avenue, where the police keep wrecked cars. I told Mordecai that the file was important, but not what was in it. Back home in my new apartment, I looked at the file. River Oaks was a real estate company. They wanted to build a new mail office for the Washington Post Office and then rent the building to them. They had bought the warehouse where Devon Hardy and Lante Burton lived, and they wanted to pull it down and start rebuilding. They were in a hurry. They wanted to start pulling the warehouse down in February. On January 27th, Hector Palma visited the warehouse. His note about that visit was on the list of documents in the file, but it wasn't actually in the file. Somebody had taken it out, almost certainly chance, after Mr. had visited us. On Friday, January 31st, Hector Palma returned to the warehouse with the police and evicted the people who were living there. The eviction had taken three hours. Hector Palma's note about it was two pages long. Although he tried to hide what he felt, it was clear that he disliked being part of the eviction. He described how Lante Burton had fought with the police. My heart stopped when I read, The mother had three children, one a baby. She lived in a two-room apartment with no bathroom. They slept on the floor. She fought with the policeman while her children watched. In the end, she was carried out of the building. I drove to 14th Street and copied the file. Then I went back to my old apartment. Claire was at the hospital. I took my sleeping bag, a few suits, my radio, the small TV from the kitchen, my CD player and a few CDs, a coffee pot, a hair dryer, and three blue towels. I left a note telling her I was gone. I didn't know what I felt. I had never moved out before. I wasn't sure how it was done. As I drove away, I didn't feel happy to be single again. Claire and I had both lost. 
Back at the 14th Street Law Center, my first visitor was my old friend Barry Nuzzo. He sat down carefully in the chair opposite my desk. He didn't want to get dirt on his expensive suit. Was he wired like Hector Palma? Maybe they had sent Barry because he was my friend and also one of Mr.'s guests that Tuesday afternoon. So, you're here for the money, he said. Joke. Of course. You're crazy. They're gonna come after you, Michael. You can't take a file. You mean a criminal lawsuit for theft? Probably. And they talked to the Bar Association. Rafter's working on it. Michael, you won't be a lawyer when they've finished. Not here, not anywhere. You're going to lose your license. I wasn't ready for that. I have the file. The file has plenty of information about Drake and Sweeney in it. You can't use the file, Michael. You can't use it in a lawsuit because you took it from our offices, and that's theft. I said nothing. I didn't know what I was going to do. But I knew I couldn't give the file back now. I had nothing else in the fight against Drake and Sweeney. Barry stood up to leave. Will you phone me sometime, Michael? He said at the door. Sure. <laughs>